Now, this is a very interesting topic. Why do people in the Middle East have some of the lowest rates of cancer if we compare this to the entire world? Let's do a deep dive. Now, the other name for the Middle East is West Asia. Now, what's conflicting about this information is they have a very low cancer rate, but a very high consumption of sugar rate. And I've done all the videos on this where sugar feeds cancer. So the question is, how are they actually getting lower rates of cancer despite consuming so much sugar? In fact, the Middle East consume more sugar than pretty much any other parts of the world. Now, yes, they have a lot of diabetes and they have obesity and they have other issues, but cancer is on the low side. Now, if we take the average of how many people get cancer in the entire world, it's 198 people out of every 100,000 people get cancer. Now, if we take a look at individual uh, parts of the Middle East, we have Saudi Arabia, 96 people get cancer out of 100,000. Yemen, 97 people out of 100,000. Oman, 104. Qatar, 107. UAE, it's 107. And Kuwait is 116 people out of 100,000 people get cancer. So you can see if you live in these countries, you have a much less risk of getting cancer. Let's compare this with Australia. 468 people out of 100,000 get cancer. They take number one. They get first place in getting cancer. Number two, Ireland is 374 people out of 100,000 people. Next one is Hungary, 368 people okay, out of 100,000. And then United States, 352 people out of 100,000 people develop cancer. So what is so unique about the Middle East? Well, number one, fasting, Ramadan. Now, Ramadan is a religious fast that extends over the course of one month. Now, that one month is just one month out of the entire year. What blows my mind is they're fasting right after sunrise to sunset. So they're usually eating before that and eating after that. So Ramadan is considered a type of intermittent fasting only for one month and produces a tremendous decrease in rates of getting cancer. That's quite remarkable. So why does fasting help with preventing cancer? Well, it starves cancer. Do you realize there's between 10 and 50 times more insulin receptors in a cancer cell versus a normal cell? What does that mean? That means that cancer cells have a very avid or greedy hunger for glucose because they have more receptors to eat glucose, okay? So this is how they diagnose cancer through a PET scan. A PET scan identifies areas in the body that have a very high metabolism of sugar. So cancer loves sugar. And when you're fasting, you're not consuming sugar. All right, number two, autophagy. Fasting stimulates autophagy, which is a condition that helps to recycle old damaged proteins. It helps to recycle old damaged things like damaged mitochondria. And if we look at what cancer really is, it's damage to your mitochondria. When the mitochondria is damaged, the mitochondria then adapts its metabolic system to a different way of uh, dealing with energy. It ferments glucose. When you fast, you kick in this autophagy and you're recycling damaged mitochondria, which is going to decrease your risk for cancer. The third thing about fasting is that when you fast, you generate new immune cells. You strengthen your immune system. Your immune system becomes stronger. You generate more killer T cells, which directly kill cancer cells and viruses. And you also stimulate more helper T cells, which indirectly help reduce cancer. All right, next point about fasting. It's one of the best things to get rid of inflammation. Cancer tends to spread, okay, migrate into areas of inflammation. So fasting is one of the most potent anti-inflammatories. So it's going to reduce the risk of cancer being spread. Also, when you fast, you increase the antioxidant networks of the body. So these things that actually protect you against free radicals, free radical damage, like in the mitochondria, are improved or enhanced when you fast. So that's going to decrease the risk of getting cancer right off the bat. Fasting is one of the oldest therapies 
Even Hippocrates uh, mentioned fasting quite extensively, and he had an interesting quote, but to eat when sick is to feed the illness, okay? So you, when you're ill, you don't want to eat very frequently. And he was considered like the foundational father of medicine. Okay, fasting is number one. Number two would be the spices that people eat in the Middle East. Turmeric, okay, loaded with anti-cancer properties. And it, it's one of the best things to get rid of inflammation. Saffron has a certain phytonutrient that's very, very anti-cancer. Cardamom, anti-cancer properties. Nutmeg, caraway, cinnamon, and coriander all have anti-tumor and anti-cancer properties. Plus, on top of that, certain foods that have additional anti-cancer properties, black seeds, olive oil, dill, sesame seeds, and dates. Now, I don't recommend consuming dates if you're trying to lose weight or if you're doing a ketogenic diet, but there are certain phytonutrients in dates that have anti-cancer properties. All right, number three, low tobacco usage for women in the Middle East, okay? Not men, okay, that's probably increased, but women. And if you actually add up the women and the men, the reduced weight of women using tobacco is so low, it makes the whole average come way down. I mean, take a look at this. 20% of the population smokes, okay? That's one out of every five people. Yet, if we look at women in the Middle East, in Iraq, it's 3%, okay? Not 20%. Yemen, it's 9%, okay, compared to 20% worldwide. And then we have Kuwait, which is only 3%. Saudi Arabia, 2%. The UAE, 0.8% of the entire female population in the UAE smokes. That's a very, very insignificant compared to the worldwide average. And then we get Oman, 0.7%, okay? Compared to 20%, insignificant amount of uh, women in that area of the world. Now, if we compare that to women in Chile, it's 40%. That's more than two times the world average. And then Serbia, it's 41%. So, smoking is definitely linked to cancer. You already know that. In fact, the risk of getting cancer if you smoke or chew tobacco is 22 times the risk compared to people that do not smoke or chew tobacco. 25% of all cancers out there are caused by either smoking or chewing tobacco. And the other thing you need to realize is there are 5,000 different chemicals in tobacco, okay, in cigarettes, okay, and 70 of them have a direct link to cancer. And uh, just as a side note, vaping also is linked to cancer of the colon, of the lung, because of the nicotine and other chemicals. And number four, alcohol is prohibited in most areas of the Middle East. Drinking alcohol increases the risk of six different types of cancer. If you drink alcohol, you're more at risk of getting cancer of the liver and also of the oral pharyngeal area, which is the area in the back of the throat and also includes the back of the tongue and the upper roof of the mouth. And it just so happens people in the Middle East have the lowest rate of getting cancer in this area of the body. The areas of the world that have the highest risk of getting this cancer are Western Europe, Northern Europe, and North America. All right, now the question is, they're doing all these spices, they're fasting, they're not smoking as much, and they're not drinking alcohol as much, then why aren't these numbers even lower, okay? Well, it's probably because they consume more sugar than any other area of the world, as well as more high fructose corn syrup, and cancer loves sugar. It could also be linked to the obesity situation. Over 30% of the population is obese, and there's more risk of getting cancer if you're obese. Also, they have very, very low vitamin D levels. In fact, 80% of the population is low in vitamin D. And vitamin D is very, very important in protecting someone against cancer and reducing the risk. And it just so happens when you consume that much sugar, you're going to also deplete vitamin D. And vitamin D is essential in keeping your immune system very, very strong. And then one last thing is called polymorphism. What is polymorphism? That is this condition where the genetics or the genes are altered in a way 
that there's kind of like a defect in the genes. And there's a higher ratio of people with this genetic uh, defect in the vitamin D receptor, okay, for vitamin D. So if your receptor is defective and you can't absorb vitamin D as well, okay, for some reason, then you're going to be low in vitamin D, in which case, if you do live in the Middle East, what you should be doing is taking more vitamin D on a regular basis. All right, now that you know why the Middle East has lower rates of getting cancer, the next question is, how could you potentially lower this even further? And I created a video just in the topic. Check this out right here.